with designing this program, uh, differences between men and women, should women then really be focusing more on the multi-joint exercises, specifically also because of the effects on the bone mineral density? I mean, is that, um, or should all of us be, I guess all of us should be focusing more on that? Yeah, w women really do, should not train much if at all different from men. The, the one area that there seems to be some evidence is that women are able to recover a little more quickly, both intersets so they can actually rest somewhat shorter and, re and gain back most of the volume load, like I said. It, it's not clear whether this has something to do endogenously internally or whether it's the fact they're just in general using lighter loads than men, so it's easier to you know come back if you're using 200 pounds versus 100. We don't know. And even the recovery between sessions uh, may be a little better, their ability to recover. Um, there's some evidence of that. But as far as the overall program, uh, I don't program women much of it all differently than men. For recovery, you hear a lot about the importance of recovery, the importance. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it means that you need to take sufficient time so that you're uh, able to come back strong for your... I, I mean, it means a lot of different things, to differ, depending on the context. But I think in the context of our talk, that you're able to come back with sufficient energy and joint-related reserves where you're able to train uh, effectively in your next session, that your training is not compromised uh, in the next time you're going to lift. Um, to some extent, it also has to do with the muscle protein synthetic response which is roughly the time course is about 48 hours, uh, can be truncated a little as you get actually more advanced. It, you can seem to get a higher spike, uh, so it happens quicker and actually trails off a little more quickly in some of the research, um, which is, I think, getting a little too much into the weeds. But theoretically, you probably wouldn't need to train a muscle or, or it would be beneficial to give it 48 hours rest so that you can maximize that and work on other things or even just recover uh, where it wouldn't be um, it certainly doesn't seem to be beneficial to train it on a daily basis the same muscle and that having that recovery allows you to do other things that would potentially develop your body or and or your health to a greater extent does it blunt hypertrophy if you're training the same muscle um, no so that? there's actually some interesting it's kind of equivocal we actually, carry, you can tell I've done a lot of work in all of these uh, variables. So we carried out a study. We had, these were young men. Um, it, it might, we don't have any evidence in older people, and I can make a case where it might, because recovery seems to be blunted in older, but I'll get to that in a minute. But in young men, we had them doing either the, the same exact routine done over three days with more. So when they did it over three days, they performed more uh, sets per session. So it was like twice, each uh, session was twice as long, or else doing shorter sessions spread out over six days, the same exact routine. And um, no difference for most of the muscles, but we looked at the biceps, and the biceps growth was much greater in the, uh, in the group that did three days versus uh, six days. Is that an anomaly? I, again, we don't know. You'd need to replicate the study. Now, as I just mentioned, older individuals' recovery uh, does start to become a factor. And uh, this is just, look, aging, you, you can't, the, certainly you can stave off aging, but you can't prevent it and, and the consequences of it. So to a large extent, we can live extremely healthy and vibrant uh, into our older years, provided we take care of our bodies and do things. But father time, mother time, uh, will catch up to some extent. And uh, we do have to take this into account with programming. So like I said, no differences with, between men and women per se, but there are differences between younger and older individuals. And one of them, when I have consulted with older individuals, is to factor in, not have as much uh, volume, so that the ability to tolerate volume seems to go down to some extent. Um, and by the way, interestingly, it seems their maintenance needs to be somewhat higher for volume. So they, they can't use as high volumes, but also they need to have a kind of a higher minimum volume to maintain their mass. There's limited evidence of that, but there was one study in particular that seemed to indicate that. Uh, and, uh, and also having more cognizance of intercession recovery and uh, sometimes having fewer sessions per week. How much recovery would the older people? I mean, like... So again, 
Uh, it, this really depends on the individual because there's older individuals, like I mentioned, that I can wipe the floor with 30 year olds uh, and there's other ones. So it, these are things that it really will depend upon. So it depends. How long have you been training? Are you in, just new when you're 60 years old to training or have you been doing it since you were 20? Um, you know, what are your, do you have joint related issues? Uh, what's your nutritional status? What's your st sleep and stress status? Are there any other medical issues? So a lot to unpack and uh, on a general level, I think most um, kind of three days a week is a default uh, that uh, would be a good, I, I mentioned that two days a week, people can still make robust gains, but I think three days a week would get you a little better gains and if possible, even on a minimalist basis, if you can do three half hour sessions per week, uh, I think that's a good kind of minimalist guideline for everyone, including older people and then you know, some individ older individuals can do a what's called a split body routine where they could do, let's say, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and upper, lower, upper, lower type routine and recover well, whereas others need that three day, you know, shouldn't do more than three days a week. All right. Is there anything that can um, speed up recovery? So recovery being uh, passive recovery, active recovery, like things that could help speed it up nutrition wise or other things as well? Yeah. Um, first of all, being recreationally active. Uh, so blood flow does help with recovery. One of the worst things you could do is just be a couch potato. So let's say you do a resistance training workout and the rest of the week you're just sitting on the couch, you know, munching on bonbons and, and watching your favorite TV shows. Um, that's it, um, um, circulation itself is going to optimize the delivery of nutrients and expedite uh, delivery and recovery in that respect. Other things have somewhat less um, evidence behind them. Uh, so massage has been shown to potentially help recovery. What's the problem with that? Well, it's hard to sham massages. So when your massage feels really good and, hey, I, I feel better, I'm going to... Was that because of the massage or because of the psychological effect that you, yeah, I feel better now, I feel vibrant? foam rolling, uh, you know, these are all things that we, it's hard to sham them properly and get a sense, was it really the, uh, was it really the treatment or was it the placebo effect? Because uh, you always want a placebo. If, you do, if you're comparing it against nothing, then hey, it felt good, so I feel I have better recovery. Um, you know, taking in proper protein itself, that to me isn't a recovery strategy. That just should be part of your lifestyle if you want to um, if you want to maximize your results, but if you're not taking in enough protein, protein are the building blocks of your muscle and uh, of any tissues, so you're not going to get uh, proper quote-unquote recovery if you're not optimizing your protein nutritional intake. And there's other, I mean, um, essential uh, fat, fatty acids, particularly your N3s, your omega-3 fatty acids seem to have certain... Uh, beneficial effects on muscle development, particularly it seems for the older people, but we don't have great evidence longitudinally. We have some good um, good acute studies that seem to show that. Um, anyway, so these are all, I think, strategies. Uh, again, cost benefit. Well, massage, if you're paying for it, there's a cost to that, but if you have let's say, a significant other that can massage you, could that help? Foam rolling, you know, really not a cost to that. Um, there is um, some evidence that um, cold water immersion, we can kind of get into this, might uh, expedite quote-unquote recovery so that you're not going to be a sore. So if, if the recovery has to do with getting back to trainability levels so that you're reducing soreness, and heat, by the way, is another thing, which generally does not seem to have negative effects at least. Uh, so again, those are potential strategies. Now, if you want to get into, it's kind of interesting with cold water immersion, cryotherapy, particularly it's been shown with the cold water immersion, there is emerging evidence that it actually has negative effects, particularly on hypertrophy, but on strength measures as well. Um, Somewhat limited evidence, but it's been shown there's triangulation of evidence, meaning that we have acute data that shows it blunts intracellular anabolic signaling, that it blunts muscle protein synthesis, satellite cell um, uh, 
some, when you talk about anabolic signaling, the pro-inflammatory response, which on one end is why, quote unquote, it helps with recovery, but the acute pro-inflammatory response actually has been shown to have a positive effect on muscle development. So chronic inflammation, bad, acute inflammation, good. At least that's the extent of what we, we see from the literature. And there's been longitudinal evidence showing that it blunts hypertrophy over longer, uh, longer term studies. Now that is when you, these studies have uh, done, been done doing this every day or very frequently post-training. Uh, I would say that if you're only gonna do it one time, let's say you're feeling really sore, nothing wrong with getting in a cold tub. Uh, it's not, doesn't mean all your gains are gonna go if you occasionally do a cold water immersion. But I do think that uh, using it frequently, uh, probably if your goal is optimizing muscle growth, not a good thing. Timing might be a concern. Uh, so if you wanna do that, uh, probably spacing it out at long periods after, but then you might not get the benefits you want. Like if you're sore, you're gonna to wanna to be doing it when you're sore. So if you're sore the following day, uh, yeah, I think that might be beneficial and where you've kind of gotten out of your window or at least gotten the majority of your uh, protein synthetic responses in. But again, the primary reasons that cold water immersion seems to have negative effects, A number one, blunting of the pro-inflammatory response, A, no A number two, a blunting of the circulatory response, that cold water uh, restricts the circulation and thus you're not getting nutrient delivery to the muscles. It's speculative, but that's the working theory. Right, so that would make sense to not do cold water immersion right after that's your sense. training. Like if yep. it's like your day, um, like I like to do cold water immersion for brain benefits, like in, you know, feeling you get norepinephrine release and it, it affects my anxiety and my mood and focus and attention. Uh, but I, I don't ever do it uh, after strength training. So it was, it's usually on a day that I'm not strength training. 